Greetings and God's blessing. This is Weekly Wisdom with Father John Corapi. Today we're going to talk about the role of the holy angels in spiritual warfare. You know, in a lot of these uh, subject matters, a lot of these things we talk about, um, one of the most important things is reality. There's a real crisis of reality, I could call it, um, in recent years. People have a very uh, attenuated, a very uh, diminished notion of reality. Very frequently, uh, they try to arrive at conclusions about reality while bracketing out a very large part of reality. By definition, God himself is reality itself. God is being itself. God's very essence is to exist. If you bracket out God then you have a skewed understanding of reality. By the same token, if you bracket out the preternatural, uh, you likewise have a diminished notion of reality. Part of God's creation, part of reality, uh, is the angels. The, the existence and activity of the angels is a doctrine of our faith. Uh, it's not somebody's mere personal opinion. It's not medieval nonsense. It's not an old wives' tale. This is reality. The angels exist, and they are active, both the good angels and the bad. Of course, in the beginning, God created everything that is and called it good, including the angels. The angels were all created good. Then, at a certain point, the what would become the bad angels or the demons... Uh, they rebelled against God. They abused the gift of intellect and free will. They basically said, non serviat, I will not serve. And thus we had the fall of the angels, which is likewise in the catechism, part of our faith. And then the whole succession of darkness and evil. There is no sense at this point in time, because you know, you and I, we're getting old. We don't have time to fool around. I don't know about you, but uh, the older you get, you know, I feel the faster time flies. You know how that unwritten law of physics that you and I know about? Man, we don't have time to waste. I certainly have no time for nonsense uh, to fiddle-faddle around with uh, people who just don't accept what we believe. Uh, now, if they're outside the church, it doesn't matter. They can believe anything they want. But if you're inside the Catholic Church, you've got to believe what the Church believes. And we believe in the existence and the activity of the angels, both good and bad. This profoundly affects reality. That profoundly affects our way of life. It affects how we live. It affects the, the battle that we are engaged in on a daily basis. The Catechism of the Catholic Church in number 328 asserts the existence of the spiritual non-corporeal beings, non-corporeal means without a body, uh, non-physical beings, pure spiritual essences, uh, these beings that sacred scripture usually calls angels is a truth of the faith. This is doctrine. This is an optional teaching. This is essential. You have to believe this if you call yourself Catholic. The witness of Scripture is as clear as the unanimity of tradition. The Catechism teaches us that the angels are a pure, spiritual, personal, and immortal creatures. They have intelligence and free will. And they glorify God without ceasing. They serve God as messengers of his saving plan. So the angels are creatures. God created them. They are pure spiritual essences. They don't have a body like human beings. That's what they are. What do they do? Well, the very word angel indicates what they do. Messenger. It means messengers. Um, you may recall the imagery from 
the Old Testament of Jacob's ladder, the angels ascending and descending. The angels bring to us messages from God, as it were, uh, thoughts, inspirations, movements of grace. They carry, the good angels carry to us those positive things to help us in the way of salvation. On the contrary, uh, the fallen angels, the bad angels, the devil uh, and his army, just the opposite. They're likewise, they've preserved that ability to carry messages. They, they convey messages to us. Oh, you've had them, and so have I. They're negative. They're temptations, um, thoughts that are rebellious in nature, that would go against the commandments and against the way of love, against God's way. So there's a battle in process. We're caught in the middle. Uh, we're not passive spectators to this combat. We're actively engaged in this combat. Whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, that doesn't change anything. The war goes on, and you're in the middle of it, and so am I. And the angels are there, the good ones and the bad ones. And so we might as well get used to the idea and act in accordance with it. You want to act in accordance with reality. Uh, if you don't, you're at your own risk. You know, in, in a war, uh, a natural war, physical kind of a war, being out of touch with reality isn't very smart. Matter of fact, it's outright dangerous. You could take the position that uh, the enemy doesn't exist. Oh, the enemy is a fiction. The enemy is an old wives' tale. And what happens? You get wiped out. You go out without your weapon, you go out with any uh, concern for the activity of the enemy, for his tactics, his weapons, and what happens? You're dead meat, in plain English. That's what happens. So you've got to be in touch with reality. And this is very, very, very real. If you've lived it all, and you've tried to live your faith at all, you know it's real. Because you've had a few uh, engagements uh, battles with the enemy. All right. Messengers. That's what the angels are. You know, when God gives us gifts, when he provides things for us to help us in the way of salvation, we would do well to pay attention and accept these things. It's kind of mind-boggling uh, how many people are so cavalier, so indifferent toward their eternal salvation. I guess they don't believe in it, they don't believe uh, that, that there's anything uh, after life, or they have the um, fictitious notion that it doesn't matter how they live. Uh, it matters. It matters a lot. Uh, two ways. Two ways are set before you, old man, the Bible says. Um, the way of good and the way of evil, the way of light and the way of darkness, the way of grace, the way of sin. Uh, therefore, choose the right path, uh, choose life, choose that which is good, the way of love, God's way. Don't go the other way. Well, that's a broad way, and it's easy to go that way, and many there are who walk down that path. Uh, God's way is a narrow way. It's harder, um, rockier road, steeper climb, dangerous, fraught with traps and snares and enemies coming from every direction. But God has provided us with the means to overcome all obstacles. The president talked about forming a coalition when the war against global terrorism was launched. Um, you know what a coalition is, a, a, a group of allies. We've got a coalition that God has given to us. Uh, we've got Jesus and Mary, our mother. We've got all the saints, and we've got the angels. Uh, pay attention to that. It's very important that we have this coalition working for us, that we're open to this. Uh, very frequent, frequently, even those who call themselves good Christians and good Catholics, uh, although uh, they believe, uh, if you ask them, do you believe in angels? Of course. Of course I do. Um, but then you have to say, well, does your daily life reflect it? Do you have a, a real relationship? You know, we've heard about and, and should hear about and should practice a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, with his Holy Mother, 
Uh, why with his mother? Listen, if she's good enough for Jesus, she's good enough for you. She's good enough for me too. Likewise, the angels and the saints, they're powerful, powerful allies. Why ignore them when they can help us so very, very much? You know, there are stories from the annals of the lives of the saints. I could tell you stories from my own life about the help uh, of the angels. Uh, very frequently, uh, I've spoken to people who are less than formally religious, uh, people who've lived rough lives, people in the streets, drug addicts, uh, alcoholics, prostitutes, people who are on the, on the edge, uh, just one foot in hell and the other one on a banana peel, so to speak. And these people will always tell you, oh yes, oh yes, there's a devil all right. There's an enemy out there. I, I have encountered him many, many times. You see, they live on the edge of darkness. Uh, they've struggled. And they understand that evil is not impersonal, that it's very personal. They know they have enemies. And you know, if you believe in the devil, you're, <laughs> you're going to believe in, in God, too. Because certainly if there's an enemy, he's the enemy of someone, and that's first and foremost God. But he can't get God directly. God's all-powerful. So what does he do? The enemy attacks God's beloved children. That's what he does. That, that's how he tries to get at God and his kingdom. But of course God is stronger. You know, if God is for you, who can be against you? So we have to be cognizant of this reality, this battle. Make sure you cultivate a personal relationship with your guardian angel. Now this is a piece of the church's teaching the church's wisdom, the existence and activity of the guardian angels, like all the angels, is real. Every human being has a personal guardian angel assigned to him. Uh, it, from the moment of conception, I would say, that's when the, the, the human being begins, the moment of conception. You get a guardian angel, a powerful being, a, a, a spiritual creation of God, why? To help you, to protect you, to guide you. Um, you know, when we're young, when we're children, we get this as original equipment. You know, when you, you get a car, you usually get a steering wheel, and you get a transmission, and you, you, you get, uh, you know, whatever else goes with the car as original equipment. Well, a human being gets a guardian angel as original equipment. Be aware of this. Pay attention to them. I mean, do you ever pray to your guardian angel? You ever ask him for help? You ever thank him? Boy, I've got to thank mine big time. I, I assure you, uh, uh, my guardian angel must be a real big one. Uh, and he's probably very, very powerful and very ornery. And the proof of that is I'm still alive. And I can tell you there are a lot of times in my life, uh, especially back in the days when I wasn't living the way I should have, that my guardian angel, I assure you, he was working overtime, and he kept me from an awful lot of trouble. Oh, in the old days, um, I was quite brainless, as many of us, unfortunately, have been in the past, but uh, I had no concern uh, for what was right, I had no concern for the dangers that surround us. Many, many times, I could have been killed in automobile accidents. I could have been killed uh, in the street, any number of ways. Um, there are so many snares and traps, so many dangerous things, uh, drinking too much, drugs, whether illegal or prescription, um, uh, illicit sexual things. The, the world is filled with the enemy's weapons and traps. Our guardian angel and all the angels are there to help us, to keep us out of trouble. And if we get into trouble, to help to get us out of that trouble, at least to keep us alive so we can live to fight another day. Pay attention to this. This is wisdom. Uh, your angel is real. We celebrated recently two major feasts in the Catholic Church. On September 29th, we have the Feast of the Archangels. St. Michael, St. Gabriel, and St. Raphael. Uh, do you know what those names mean? You know, in antiquity, 
a name represented much more than it does today. A name uh, revealed something about the one carrying the name. Uh, for instance, a man named Smith. He probably was just that, a blacksmith. Uh, the quintessential example of this is Jesus. Uh, the, the name means God saves or Savior. Uh, that's a perfect example. Of it. Again, angel, messenger. So, this meant a great deal in antiquity, and, and it's instructive now. The name Michael, Mikael, from the Hebrew, who is like unto God, is harkens back to the fall of the angels when... Uh, as the uh, tradition, uh, the ancient tradition in the church has it, uh, God revealed his plan of the incarnation and redemption. And Lucifer, one of the brightest of the angels, uh, brightness is synonymous with intelligence. Light is synonymous with truth. Uh, Lucifer was uh, one of the best angels, one of the brightest angels, one of the smartest angels. But when presented with God's plan, blinded by his own light, that's another way of saying pride, blinded by his own light, Lucifer chose darkness. And remember, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning, and he took a third of the angels with him. And so the fall of the angels was a rebellion. Non serviat rang out in the heavens. Michael, St. Michael's response, qui sud Deus? Who is like unto God? Uh, and, and there you had the beginning of the warfare between the good angels and the bad. This is not an old wives' tale either. This has come down to us through the tradition of the church. The saints, fathers and doctors of the church, believed them. <laughs> Who are we not to? There is certainly a spiritual combat that has been in process ever since then. So we celebrate this feast of St. Michael. Uh, it's all the archangels now. It used to just be the Feast of St. Michael. But then we included uh, St. Gabriel. Um, St. Gabriel is the messenger of God. Um, uh, Gabriel uh, brings us um, the messages uh, from God. Remember, he was the angel of the incarnation, most likely. An angel that showed up in Scripture from time to time. And Raphael, the healing power of God. So Michael, who is like unto God? Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel is the power of God, or the, the, the one who brings God's power to bear the messages from God. And then Raphael, the, um, the healing power of God. He's the kind of like represents God's healing power. Uh, you remember from um, the book of Tobit, uh, the angel, the archangel uh, Raphael, uh, effected healing. Um, often we'll pray to St. Raphael, and I would highly suggest you do this. You know, you need protection. Pray to St. Michael. Uh, you need God's power to strengthen you. Uh, some of the saints have said that it was um, Gabriel who was the angel that was in the Garden of Gethsemane to strengthen Jesus in his agony. Uh, you, the healing power of God. I often invoke the intercession of St. Raphael, the archangel, uh, in a situation where healing whether it's physical, emotional, or moral. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm aware that I need help in this battle. And so why not use these powerful, powerful uh, friends and messengers of God? We need to do that. They are intensely involved in this war for souls. It's very wise to cultivate a relationship and a love for the holy angels. They help us, and they're right in the, at the, heart, of the, in the heart of the church's devotion. Um, we have uh, the feast days, September 29th, for the archangels, and then October 2nd is for the guardian angels. We have a memorial for the guardian angels. And so recall these things. Uh, ask your angel for help. Thank him. Thank him. Make him part of your life. This is part of reality, if in fact you're in touch with reality, the higher reality that involves the spiritual, the preternatural, the supernatural. This is very real. And so enter into the reality. And remember that Christ, the Lord, is the center of the angelic realm. 
Uh, it, it was through Jesus, the eternal word, that our Heavenly Father created everything that is, including the angels. And the angels uh, worship God. The angels serve Christ. He's, in a sense, the leader of the angelic realms. He's the commander-in-chief. Our Lady, uh, she's uh, Our Lady of the Angels. She, she has a very special uh, relation with the angels. This is all reality. This is all truth. This is wisdom. Make it part of your life, and I assure you, you will be a great step further ahead toward achieving the very end of this life, toward achieving what God has placed us on this earth to do, to love him, to serve him, to know him with our whole heart, mind, and strength. Stay close to the angels. I assure you, they are close to you. God bless you.